السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله والصفيه وخليله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا أما بعد So as we continue with the ocean of benefit that is in the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam between the tashahhud and the taslim and that is the dua where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Allahumma bi ilmika al-ghayb wa qudratika ala al-khalq أحيني ما علمت الحياة خير لي وتوفني إذا كانت الوفاة خير لي اللهم إني أسألك خشتك في الغيب والشهادة وأسألك كلمة الحق في الغضب والرضا وأسألك القصد في في الفقر والغنى and we arrive at the portion of the hadith today uh, line number six, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Wa asaluka naimin la yanfad." O oh Allah, by your knowledge of the unseen and your power over your creation, give me life so as long as you know that life is better for me, and to take my life so as long as you know that death is better for me. O oh Allah, I ask you for fear of you whether in public and in pri- or in private, and I ask you for the ability to say the truth, whether I am angry or whether I am pleased with an individual, and I ask you for al-qastu fil faqri wal ghina, and I ask you for al-qastu, tawassut, you know, to be, um, to be uh, fair and to be, you know, uh, balanced, whether I'm rich or whether I'm poor, whether in poverty or whether in... Um, uh, prosperity, and then we come to the portion of the du'a where the Prophet ﷺ said, "Wa as'aluka naiman la yanfad," and I ask you for naim. I ask you for a pleasure that will never stop and a never-ending pleasure. Naiman la yanfad. And for those of us who are, you know, kind of going through something right now, and we we're probably always. You know, at some point or another going through something in our lives This lecture is definitely something that should resonate with you To ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Na'eeman la yanfad To give me a pleasure that will never stop A perpetual state of pleasure that will never end A perpetual state of pleasure that will never end. So this is the portion of the hadith that we come to from this beautiful du'a that has an ocean of meaning. Um, we covered in the last lecture uh, having a tawassut or having a balance, having a balance um, between prosperity and poverty. That when you're in poverty, that you should be patient, and when you're in prosperity, you should be grateful. Now we're asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala What might seem like a, a more extreme And you look at the previous lines of this dua We were asking basically a balance between two extremes But now we're just going for the gusto We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Na'eeman la yinfat Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a perpetual state of pleasure and bliss That will never end Obviously when we're having a good time We never wanted it to end you ever had a good day, you know, maybe with your children, with your spouse, you're out, and it's, it's, it's the best day ever, you know, and you don't ever want that day to end. That is usually the sentiment of people when, or sentiment of the human being, when we have those, you know, moments, those moments of joy and pleasure in our lives. And then they come, you know, in spurts. They come in intervals. You know, we, we have moments where... You know, we're kind of going through things and then we have some days, some moments where we, you know, are engaged in a certain way where we don't want that feeling to end, right? We don't want that feeling to end. So 
we're asking Allah. So, so it's natural as a human being that when you experience in, you know, times of pleasure, that you don't want that pleasure to end. And we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as'aluka na'eeman la yanfad. We're asking you for a, a perpetual state of bliss and pleasure that will never end. Right? That will never end. Um, the scholars who explain this hadith, they say, A la yanqadi wa la yantahi. وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا النَّعِيمُ الْآخِرَةِ يَعْنِي نَعِيمُ الْجَنَّةِ كَمَا قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَمَا عِنْدَكُمْ يَنْفَدْ وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقٍ That the scholars, they say that what is meant by this portion of the hadith, what the Prophet ﷺ meant here, أَسْأَلُكَ النَّعِيمٍ لَا يَنْفَدْ I ask you for a pleasure that will never end, meaning the pleasure of the hereafter, meaning the pleasure of Jannah. Jannah will never end. When you enter into paradise, you enter into Jannah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for myself first and for you all, paradise, to grant us paradise, to grant us the highest level in paradise, Jannah til firdaus al a'la, to grant us the highest place in paradise. But Jannah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, la, um, لا يمسهم فيها نصب ولا هم منها بمخرجين. That when you enter into Jannah, there will be no nasab, there will be no pain anymore. No more pain, right? You will feel no more pain. It's it, it's over. The pain of this life, the pain of the grave, and all the pain of the, you know, the, the standing in the, you know, this open plain waiting to be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us are sweat coming up to our knees. Some of us are sweat coming up to our thighs. Some of us are sweat coming up to our waist. Some of us are sweat coming up to our shoulders. Some of us are sweat going in our mouths. And every one of us will sweat based upon the level of sin that you know you have to answer for. As the Prophet wasallam so clearly and uh, explicitly, you know, explained to us. After all of that pain, the pain of this life, this life is not about this 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 life. La, as Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه we said, لا راحة في الجنة, لا راحة في الجنة, لا راحة في الدنيا. That there is no relaxation in this life. This life is nothing but pain. It's pain. And remind, remember, this life was a punishment for Adam. And then we're here expecting joy and bliss and to live a you know this you know this life of you know just happiness and utopia. You know, this desire for euphoric pleasure that is in Jannah, that's not in this life. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and we said, La rahata fil dunya. There's no pleasure, there's no no absolute, you know, euphoric pleasure in this life. إِنَّمَا الرَّاحَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِنَّمَا الرَّاحَ فِي الْجَنَّةِ that, that actual pleasure and relaxation is when you get into Jannah. Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said that I will never feel comfortable until both of my feet are firmly planted inside on the soil of Jannah. Then I can relax. Then I can, you know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people in Jannah, لا يمسهم فيها نصب وَلَا هُمْ مِنْهَا بِمُخْرَجِينَ No pain will touch them anymore. وَلَا هُمْ مِنْهَا بِمُخْرَجِينَ Nor will they be ever asked to leave. Nor will they be ever asked to leave because the pleasure of Jannah is eternal. The pleasure of Jannah is eternal. So when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala الْنَعِيمِ مِنْ لَا يَنْفَدْ uh, a pleasure that will be eternal, that will never end. Some of the scholars say that this means Jannah. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا عِنْدَكُمْ يَنْفَدْ And what you have will eventually come to an end. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقٍ And what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal. What is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal. It will never stop. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقٍ Everything that we have as human beings will eventually come to an end. Your money will eventually come to an end. Your life 
will eventually come to an end. Your health will eventually come to an end. Your children will eventually come to an end. Your house, your car, your jewelry, everything that you have at some point in this life or after your demise will eventually come to an end. Nothing is perpetual. Ma'andakum yanfad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what is with you? Meaning, ma, yani everything that is with you. Ma al mawsul alladhi andik. Everything that you have with you will eventually come to an end. Wa ma inda Allahi baqin. And everything that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will endure. Everything that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will endure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يُبَشِّرُهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْهُ وَرِدْوَانًا وَجَنَّةٍ لَهُمْ فِيهَا نَعِيمٌ مُقِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that your Lord gives them glad tidings of rahmah, of mercy from Him, وَرِدْوَانًا and pleasure from Him, وَجَنَّةٍ and gardens, gardens, وَجَنَّةٍ فِيهَا لَهُمْ فِيهَا نَعِيمٌ مُقِيمٌ and jannat, gardens, Lahum fiha, and for them in those gardens, Naimun Mukim is a pleasure that will never end. That will never end. When you enter into Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ask you to leave, and the pleasures that you experience will never stop. You know, the, think about the best day that you have ever had in your life, and you said, I never want this day to end. I want this day to continue. On and on and on, I never want this day to end. You ever had one of those days? You ever had one of those moments where you say to yourself, I just don't want this day to end. I'm having such a good time. Think about Jannah. <laughs> that when you enter into Jannah, that state will be perpetual, will be eternal. It will never stop. It will never stop. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Yadu Allahi fil hadith. He said, Yadu Allahi mali'un. لا تغيذها نفقة أرأيت ما أنفق أو ما أنفق منذ خلق السماوات والأرض فإنه لم يغذ ما في يمينه سبحانه وتعالى فما عند الله لا ينقص بالعطاء. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that Allah سبحانه وتعالى's hands will never be empty because of what He gives to His creation. Pay attention to this narration. So deep. The words of the Prophet Sallallahu as he describes Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to us. We only know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala through one of two ways: either because of what Allah reveals to us about Himself Subhanahu Wa Taala, or what was given to us of a description of Him by His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those are the only two avenues that we have to know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Allah revealing some, you know, verses or revealing some sifat, some qualities, some characteristics, some attributes about Himself that you karibuna ila ma'na that that will bring us closer to the meaning because we will never totally grasp the meaning of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's names and attributes. We will never fully grasp the depth of it, the density of it. We will never fully grasp it, but it will bring us close and close to the meaning of it. Or the Prophet Sallallahu giving us some type of description about Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says here, "Yadullahi mali," that the hands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala are full. La taghiduha nafqatun. Allah's spending on His creation will never decrease what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has in His hands. He said, "Araytu ma umfika or ma amfika min the khalq al-samawati wal-ard." Don't you see that since the creation of the heavens and the earth, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has constantly been spending on His creation, for in the la yaghid ma fi yamini. And what is in the right hand of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has never been decreased. Since the creation of the heavens and the earth, Allah has been spending on His creation. Al Razak, Al Kareem. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is Al Razak. He is the All Provider. He is Al Kareem. He is the generous. Yung fiqo kafe yasha. Allah gives and spends on His creation, however He wills. And since the creation of the heavens and the earth, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, what He has in His hands has never been decreased. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Yad Allahi mali." 
Mali'un that the hands of the hands of Allah, the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is full. La tughidhuha nafaqatun. Spending on Allah's creation does not subtract from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. To give us a even more depth, a more deeper understanding of this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in an authentic hadith, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is found in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Muslim on the authority of Abu Dharr, Al-Ghifari, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ibadi, O my servants, Lo anna awwalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum qamu fi sa'idin wahidin fasa'aluni fa'ataytu kulla insanin mas'alata ma naqasa dharika ma indi illa kama yanqusu al-mikhyat idha udkhila al-bahar The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listen to this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi O oh, my servants, lo anna awwalakum, if the first of you that I created, wa akhirakum, all the way to the last of my creation. And we're not just talking about just human beings. He said, wa jinn insakum, wa jinnakum, the jinn and the human being. From the first of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation to the last of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, the jinn and mankind. Qamu fi sa'idin wahidin Were to all stand on one flat plane Wa yas'aluni And were to ask me whatever they wanted Thumma a'ataytu kulla insanin mas'alata And then I was to give every individual what they asked for Ma naqasa dharika ma'indi That would not subtract from what I have of my dominion that will not subtract from what I have, illa kal mikhyat ida utkhil al bahar. Except like a needle, if it was dipped in the ocean. If you went right now to one of the major bodies in the world, major bodies of water in the world, you go to the Atlantic Ocean, right? Go to the Atlantic Ocean, go to the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, you stick a pin, a needle in that water and then lift it out. That one droplet of water that would fall off of that needle, right, in comparison to that huge body of water, would mean absolutely nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if the first of you that I created to the last of you that I created, from the jinn and mankind were to all stand on one flat plane and ask me for whatever it is you wanted. Ask me whatever you wanted. And I was to give every single one of you what you asked for. Ma naqasa dharika ma indi. That would not subtract from what I have. Except like a needle if it was dipped into an ocean. Meaning it wouldn't subtract anything. Hada ala sigat al-mubalagha. Ta'keed al-kalam. This is the way that the Prophet sallallahu wasallam the way that the Arabs use metaphors to drive home emphasis, to emphasize speech. To emphasize speech, they would use metaphors like this, especially using large bodies of water um, as a metaphor. So the Prophet sallallahu is trying to bring us closer to the meaning that nothing subtracts from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. Nothing. Al-maqsood tahkik adam al-naqs wa ta'kidi. That the meaning of this metaphor is to emphasize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's dominion will not be decreased because he spends on his creation. So when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, na'im min la yanfat, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for an eternal bliss that will never dissipate, that will never disappear, that will never stop. We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his jannah, or we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever khair that he has, because all good is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and nothing can stop Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from spending. Musa and Khidr, we know that they had some interaction. We know that the whole reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Khidr to Musa was to teach Musa a lesson. Musa was asked, Man a'lamu ahl al Who is the most knowledgeable person on the face of the earth? And Musa said, Anna, I am. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Khidr to Musa to show Musa, فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ That above everyone who has knowledge is someone that is more knowledgeable. 
above everyone that believes that they have knowledge is one that is more knowledgeable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Khidr, he said to Musa, مَا نَقَصَ عِلْمِي وَعِلْمُكَ مِنْ عِلْمِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا مِثْلَ مَا نَقَصَ هَذَا الْعُسْفُورِ مِنَ الْبَحْرِ فَمَهْمَا أُخِذَ مِنْهُ لَمْ يَنْقُصْهُ شَيْءٍ Khidr said to Musa, that my knowledge and your knowledge in comparison to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not decrease or subtract from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for the same amount of subtraction that if a bird went to the ocean and put a little bit of water in its beak, then that amount of water that subtracts from that huge body of water, right? The amount of water in the, in the mouth or in the beak of the bird in comparison to that large, huge body of water, that would be the comparison between my knowledge and the knowledge of Musa to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning absolutely nothing. Meaning if Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam everything. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَى كُلَّهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and we taught Adam the names of everything. And teaching Adam the names of everything still did not decrease from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مَا عِنْدَكُمْ يَنْفَدْ وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقٍ What is with you will eventually disappear and what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never disappear. It is eternal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about just the fruits. We're not even talking about Jannah. We're talking about the fruits of Jannah. The faqiha, the fruit of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لا مقطوعة ولا ممنوعة وفاكهة ممدودة لا مقطوعة لا مقع لا مقطوعة ولا ممدود ولا ممنوعة that فاكهة that in جنة there will be فاكهة there will be fruits spread out لا مقطوعة ولا ممنوعة يعني إذا أخذ العبد منها شيئا خرج مكانها مثلها لا تختفي في فصل وتظهر في آخر بل هي على الدوام The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the scholars of Tafsir, they say what this means is that the fruits in Jannah, they're spread out all over Jannah. And every time you pull from a fruit in Jannah, right, another fruit will grow in its place immediately. The fruit in Jannah will never run out. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-Jannah. وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَعَمَلٍ O oh Allah, we ask you for Jannah and what will bring us closer to Jannah from statements and actions. SubhanAllah Allahim. وَفَاكِحَةٍ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and multitudes of fruit, لَا مَقْتُوعَةٍ وَلَا مَمْنُوعَةٍ It will not stop and you will never be prohibited from eating from it. There will never be anything in Jannah again that we cannot eat from. لا مقطوعة ولا ممنوعة. That these fruits, every time you pick from one of the fruits of Jannah, another fruit will grow in its place immediately. You can keep picking, and the fruit will always grow back immediately. It will never stop. What is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? مَا عِنْدَكُمْ يَنْفَدْ وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقٍ What is with you will eventually disappear and what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always be there. Eternal. قِيلَ النَّعِيمُ الَّذِي لَا يَنْفَدْ هُوَ النَّعِيمُ الْقَلْبِ اللَّهِ جَلَ وَعَلَ بِطَاعَتِهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَ Some of the scholars, they say that no, what the Prophet sallallahu meant when he said, وَأَسْأَلُكَ نَعِيمٍ لَا يَنْفَدْ and we ask you for a perpetual state of bliss that will never, ever stop. What this means is a heart that is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through obedience to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it does, some of the scholars say it doesn't necessarily mean Jannah. It means a heart that is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When your heart is connected to Allah, that is when you are at your pinnacle of bliss. 
The pinnacle of bliss is when your heart is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu was the most generous win in Ramadan, when he was closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The closer you are to Allah, the more na'im, the more bliss, the more pleasure you experience. So when the Prophet sallallahu asked for na'im and la yanfat, Ask for a perpetual state or an eternal state of bliss, meaning a heart that is always connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through obedience to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qala Malik ibn Dinar, one of the scholars of the past, Malik ibn Dinar, he said, Ma taladdha mutaladdhidhuna bifi'li, bimithli dhikri lahi ta'ala. He said, Those who taste the sweetness of faith have never tasted a sweetness like that. That like the sweetness that comes from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who has ever tasted a sweetness, an internal state of bliss, has done so by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like the sweetness that you taste internally when you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, فَالنَّعِيمْ بِطَاعَةِ اللَّهِ لَا يَنْفَدْ He says, so the perpetual state of bliss that you experience when you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never go away. When you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that state, that state of bliss that you feel, that pleasure that you feel, it will never go away so as long as you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, لِأَنَّ الطَّاعَةَ يَنْشَرِخُ بِهَا الصَّدْرِ He said, because when you are obedient to Allah, your chest expands. وَيَفْرَحُ بِهَا الْقَلْبِ And your heart Feels joy. وَيَأْنَسُ الْعَبْدِ بِرَبِّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى He said, and you find a closeness, you find an intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are obedient to Him. He said, بِخِلَافَ الشَّهَوَاتِ الدُّنْيُوِيَّةِ الْمُحَرَّمَةِ He said, opposite the person who gives in to his lower desires or her lowly desires. Opposite the person that gives in to their impulses and their lowly desires. He said, فَإِنَّهَا كِالطَّعَامْ لَذِيذَ مَسْمُومَ He said, giving, giving into your impulses and your desires is like a person who eats fruit that is sweet, but it is poisoned. A person that gives in to their desires because doing it, it feels good at the moment. It feels so good at the moment. Like a person who eats a piece of fruit that's sweet, but it's poisoned. Eventually, that poison is going to catch up to you. So while you engage in your acts of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it seems, it feels really good. Going to a club, it feels good. Even You know, when you first do it, you feel a little uncomfortable. But then your heart get, begins to blacken, and the action actually starts to seem fair-seeming. Shaitan begins to, you know, employ his greatest technique, which is to make evil seem fair seen. Not Like it's not that big of a deal. So at first when you begin to engage in acts that are haram, you, you, know, you know, at the beginning you feel uncomfortable. Your heart starts to beat really fast. You start to sweat, you know, the first time you engage in it. Then you, you know, you kind of break through that mold and shaitan makes it easier and easier for you to continue and do more and do more and go further. Right? Because you got to get rid of that dissonance. You got to get rid of that, that internal dissonance, that uncomfortable feeling that the Prophet Sallallahu said. He said, well, if a hack of nafs, that sin is what wavers in the chest, you feel uncomfortable with it. If it doesn't feel right and you don't like feeling like that, but you still want to sin. So you're not going to give up the sin, but you got to find a way to get rid of the dissonance. You got to find a way to get rid of that. So what do we do? We start to downplay the sin. It's not that big of a deal. We start to look at comparing your sin to what other people are doing. Well, I'm not doing, at least I'm not doing what this person is doing. You start to downplay it because you got to be able to live with that sin. You want to keep sinning. And in order for that to happen, you have to downplay the effect of the sin. You have to get rid of that dissonance, right? This is what slave owners used to do by beating and torturing and massacring their slaves. They went to church on Sunday and they interpreted verses from the Bible that made it okay for them to go home from church and torture and rape and slaughter the slaves that they owned. How else were they, you know, how else were they going to continue to do that? 
How else were they ever going to be able to continue doing that? The human being can't live in this dual nature. They, they can't live in this dual dimension. We are one dimensional as, as human beings, right? You can't live in this dual state, this dual dimensional state of being, you know, um, you know, just being totally, you know, satanic at one end and then being purely righteous on another end. So you got to find a way to get rid of that dissonance. So they interpreted verses from the Bible that, you know, justified, you know, the beating and the torturing and the raping of slaves, you know, which is, you know, something that people still do today. They take verses of the Bible, they interpret it in a way that allows them people, you know, people do it with homosexuality. People do it with all all types of acts, sinister acts, acts, satanic acts that they engage in, but still trying to maintain a righteous side to them at the same token. So we got to get rid of that dissonance. He said, but sin, he said, following your desires, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, كَالْطَعَامِ الَّذِيذِ مَسْمُومِ it said it's like eating sweet fruit or eating good food that is actually poisoned. He said, Man akalahu tatamatta. He said, whoever eats from that food is obviously going to taste good. It's going to be pleasurable, right? It's going to be pleasurable. He said, Thumma, Thumma al Akiba. He said, Tatamatta bihi lahvat. ثم تكون عاقبته إما موت وإما ال إما العطب وإما المرض وإما وأما النعيم بطاعة الله جل وعلا فهو نعيم لا ينفد. He said the person who engages in you know gives in to their lowly desires like a person that eats food that is sweet it's good it's pleasurable but it's poisoned. And eventually that poison catches up to you. So while you're eating and you're enjoying the food. Um, you do realize that once you digest that food and that settles in your body, then that you know poison begins to spread throughout your body and it's eventually going to catch up to you. He says, so then you got to deal with the you know the the aftermath. You have to deal with the end result of that, which could either be death, it could either be you know another form of punishment, it could either be sickness. Um, or whatever that you have to deal with because of that. He said, but as for the na'im bi ta'atillah, as for the pleasure that you experience from obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for who are na'imun la yanfat, then it is a pleasure that will never stop. Subhanallah alim. Very heavy. Very heavy. These are words that you got to sit down and just listen to again. You got, these are words that you have to sit down and replay to yourself. These are words that you have to sit with for a little bit and let those words resonate with you. Let it marinate with you. You know, this is not something, oh, that was a good lecture, mashallah, tabarakallah, without going back and actually trying to digest this information. Some of the scholars, they said, Lo ya'alam al-muluk. وأبناء الملوك ما نحن فيه من نعمة لا جالدون عليها بالسيوف. Some of the scholars of the past they used to say, if some of the kings and the children of the kings knew the the نعمه the blessing that we are in or the blessing that we have because of our obedience to Allah and our remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la jaladuna alayha bisuyuf. They would fight us with their swords to have it. They would unsheathe their swords. They would fight us to have what we have if they knew the, the blessing, the joy that we experience. And make no mistake about it, we live in environments with non-Muslims who look at us and you know, they're miserable, they're suffering from, you know, the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them that they can't make sense of, right? Because they, they're they not, in many times, many instances, not religious enough, don't have a connection, a, a, a real, serious, sincere connection to any level of religiosity to try to make sense of the things that are happening to them in their lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, don't you see that we sent a test to them marratin or marratain? That a year, uh, every year, fi kulli amin, that every year we send a test or two to them, a big test, one or two to them, and it still does not turn them away from their disbelief. 
Test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us in our lives are meant to bring us back to him. Meant to turn our attention back to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. After this dunya, after this world diverts our attention to something else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a test, allows a test to overcome us, allows a calamity, allows some affliction, some adversity to overtake us, to bring us back to his remembrance subhanahu wa ta'ala. But many of them, even after being tested once and twice within a year, it still does not turn them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They go further. They go further in their perdition. So, you take, for example, many non-Muslims that, you know, we work around, that, you know, we live around, and they look at us. And when they see us, you don't know the image that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing them to see. We know that when we get dressed in the morning, we look at ourselves in the mirror, we get dressed in the morning, there's a particular image that we are concerned with, right? But then there's another image beyond that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the creation to see, that we are not aware of. So while you're walking and you think, I'm just me, you know, I'm just Shadi Muhammad, just walking, doing what I do every day, you don't know the type of image that Allah has beautified Right? Has beautified because of your iman, because of your wudu, because of your sujood, because of your salat, because of your recitation of Quran. These are all things that brighten you. Did you know that? Your recitation of Quran, it brightens your face. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will call on the reciters of Quran, Yom al Qiyamah, and will tell them, Iqra, waru taqi, read. Just like you used to read in the dunya, read now. And for every ayah that you read, you your station, your place is going higher and higher and higher. And this is of course in Jannah. So what do you think about in this life? When you make wudu, the, the, the brightness from your face emanates because of the wudu that you make. You're just making wudu, you don't think anything of it. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't see except the physical image. But there's another image. That you can't see, that other people can see. The Prophet Wasallam, what did he used to say when he looked in the mirror? Allahumma kama ahsanta khalqi, fa ahsan khuluqi. Oh Allah, just as you have perfected my outward, perfect my inward. So there's an inward beauty, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows others to see. Your, 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 your ibadah, you are radiating, you know, illuminating every room that you walk into because of your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So while you look at yourself and you don't really see anything unusual, anything spectacular about your image, you don't know how other people see you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, during some of the battles, he used to make the Muslim army, although they were small, he would make their numbers look larger in the eyes of the kuffar. Did you know that? There's a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them look more in number in the eyes. So while the Muslims are meager numbers, 317 during the battle of Badr, you know, um, roughly 700 during the battle of Uhud, you know what I mean? These are small numbers. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making those numbers look huge in the eyes of the kuffar. When they look, they see more than what it really is. So using that, looking at that same concept of someone who is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a constant state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you look at your image and it doesn't really seem like much. But you don't know how other people see you. So while you, you know, getting your family together, you're getting ready for Jumu'ah, you got on your thobe, your, your wife got on her jilbab and your kids, and you're getting everybody in the car, your next door neighbors are looking out the window, jealous, gritting on you, ice grilling you from way, from, from far. Why are they so happy? I hate those Muslims. They can't stand it because they don't understand it. They can't stand it because they don't understand it. Wallah al I remember... I used to be a barber working in a barber shop. A young lady came in a barber shop to get her child's haircut. And she said to me one day, she said, can I ask you a question? I don't mean to be offensive, but I, I want to ask you a question. I said, sure. She said, what type of soap do you use on your face? <laughs> you know, I just laughed because I know where she's going with the question, but I, I can't 
I don't even know how to respond in a way where it's going to resonate with her. She wouldn't even understand. She said, what type of soap? Like, do you use like black soap? Like, what type of soap do you use on your face? Your skin is so clear. Your skin is so clear. And I said that if I told you, you wouldn't understand me. If I told you, you wouldn't understand me. She said, try me. I said, well, as Muslims, you know, we pray five times a day. She said, yeah, I'm aware of that. I said, well, before we pray, we have to wash our, you know, wash certain parts of our bodies. And part of washing our bodies is washing the face. She said, so your face is like that because you wash it with water five times a day? I said, no, that is just, you know, that's just a ritual. The illumination comes from prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, putting the most precious part of your body in the lowest part of the earth, which is a form of humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only thing that Allah will grant you when you humble yourself in front of him is a rif'ah, will raise you in degrees. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, مَا تَوَاضَعَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى No one humbles himself before Allah except Allah will raise you in degrees. You are prostrate every time you put your head on the ground. You are doing something that shaitan refused to do. Don't you think that in order to push it in the face of shaitan, that every time one of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prostrate to him, he's going to brighten your face, he's going to make you look, he's going he's to magnify your illumination to spite shaitan? Showing shaitan that this is what you should have did when I commanded you and you would have gotten way more than what I'm giving my servants. But you refuse. Right? It's just like you you ask somebody to do something and the person says, nah, I ain't doing it. And then you ask another person to do it. They say, yeah, they humble themselves. They say, yeah, I'll do it. You're going to reward that person with more than you would have normally to spite the person who refused to do it the first time. That's exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing when he illuminates us. Shaitan is fire, smokeless fire. Shaitan al-rajim, rajim meaning ba'id on rahmatillah. That he is distant, far from any mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't think on the opposite side of that. Every time you prostrate before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is gonna brighten your face. Shaitan is dark and smoky and cloudy and you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to... Look at the face of a Muslim who doesn't pray. Look at the face of a Muslim who doesn't pray. How dark and gloomy the face is. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminates our face. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever reads Surah Al-Kahf, Surah number 17, Surah number 18 in the Quran, every Jumu'ah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will brighten his face, will illuminate his light, will extend his light until the next Jumu'ah. Meaning you already have light. When you read Surah Al-Kahf, Allah will illuminate, will, will brighten your light and extend it into the next Jumu'ah. SubhanAllah. This is, this is real, real talk. So while we look at ourselves and we don't see much when we see ourselves in the mirror, there is a spiritual a spiritual image that you carry with you that some people see to be greater as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way of spiting those people for their disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they look at the Muslim, it might just be a regular Muslim, nothing spectacular about them. But because of their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah illuminates their faces, illuminates their being in the eyes of those who choose to disobey him, to spite them, and it only increases, لِيُغِيذَ بِهِمُ kufar, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, to, you know, just to rub it in the faces of those who disbelieve. So while, you know, people are gritting on you from afar, and you're trying to figure out, like, I don't even have nothing, you got more than I have. You know, I'm struggling to pay rent, I'm struggling to, you know, live in, you know, live in, Paycheck to paycheck, you got more than I have materialistically, and you still jealous of me. <laughs> you still jealous of me. Because you have something that they can never have. 
And that is because of that closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some of the scholars of the past, they used to say, لَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْمُلُوكُ وَأَبْنَاءَ الْمُلُوكُ مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ مِن نِعْمَةٍ لَجَالَدُونَ عَلَيْهَا بِالسُّيُوفِ That if the kings and the sons of kings knew the ni'mah, the blessing that we are in, the bounty that we are experiencing, they would fight us with swords to have it. And in ending, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, na'im and la yanfit, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a perpetual state of bliss that will never go away. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, and this was a man who died in prison, he said, ma yasna'u bi a'da'i, what can my enemies do to me? He said, وَأَنَا جَنَّتِي وَبُسْتَانِي فِي قَلْبِي He said, my jannah, my paradise is in my heart, they can't take that away from me. You can do whatever you want to do to me. That you will never be able to take away from me. He said, in such in the sijni khalwa. He said, my prison cell is private time for me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Wa qatli shahada and killing me, I die as a martyr. Wa ikhraji min baladi siyaha. And removing me from my country, removing me from my land, I will make it hijrah. It's, it's a hijrah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What can my enemies do to me? Nothing. My jannah is here, a perpetual state of bliss and happiness because of my connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can never take that away from me. You can never take that away from me. When couples separate, sometimes the, the wife wants to take this and take that and child support, whatever. You can have it all. Wallahi, you can have it all. You will never get the jannah that is here. You will never have that. You can have the money. You can have the couch. You can have the TV. You can have anything you want from this dunya. My jannah is right here in my heart. You will never have that. You will never have that. Vice versa, man leaves, he takes the money, he's not paying child support, he's not doing this, anything, not taking care of anything financially. Don't worry about it. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, إِنَّ فِي الدُّنْيَا جَنَّةً مَنْ لَمْ يَدْخُلْهَا لَمْ يَدْخُلْ جَنَّةً الْآخِرَةً Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Indeed, in this life, in this dunya, there is a paradise. Whoever does not enter it, will not enter into the paradise in the hereafter. He's talking about the paradise that lies under remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that is a jannah. It is a na'im la yanfad. It is a pleasure, a state of bliss that will never disappear. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us jannah. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an, a state, a perpetual state of happiness and bliss that will never leave us, whether in this life with our connection to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, or in the hereafter in Jannah, where we can grab from the fruits of Jannah, and every time we pick a fruit, there will be another fruit that will grow in its place, because the fruits and the, the, the bounty of Jannah will never disappear. No pain will touch us, nor will we be asked to leave. لا يمسهم فيها نصب ولا هم منها بمخرجين No pain will touch you, nor will you be asked to leave. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى I'll open up the chat for uh, some questions and answers but going back to the beginning of the dua uh, hopefully إن شاء الله everyone is memorizing line for line بإذن الله all the way up until where we are right now line number six اللهم بإنك الغيب وقدرتك على الخلق أحيني ما علمت الحياة خير لي وتوفني ما علمت الوفاة خير ما علمت الوفاة خير لي uh, اللهم إني أسألك خشيتك في الغيب والشهادة وأسألك كلمة الحق في الغضب والرضا وأسألك عن وأسألك القصف الفقر والغنى وأسألك نعيم من لا ينفد so we are on line number six from this du'a. As I said, there were 13 lines in total. We are at line number six, bi'ithni la ta'ala. Seven more lines to go. And if you memorize it line by line, inshallah ta'ala, understanding the meanings, this ocean of meaning that are behind these small statements, inshallah ta'ala, this will be a du'a that you can make continuously and you will never forget. Inshallah ta'ala, I'll open up the chat for a few moments for some questions and answers. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.